A little taste test. What's amazing about food is that even though we do it three times a day, every day for our entire life, most people have no idea why they choose the foods they choose or why they eat what they eat. On a scale of one to 10, what would you rate it? You made other cookies? Yeah. One. My name is Brian Wansink. I'm professor and director of the Cornell University Food and Brand Lab and author of the book, Mindless Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think. A marketing expert and prize-winning nutritionist, Brian Wansink has been called the Sherlock Holmes of food. Dedicated to the study of why we eat what we do, he has proven that what we enjoy is as much about the plate as what we find on it. Dinner at his house is frequently an experiment in itself, since Wansink isn't beyond pulling a few tricks, all in the name of research. We're having three friends over tonight for dinner, and I'm fortunate because my wife is a Lakota Blue trained chef. Smells good in here. So for starters, we're going to have baby field greens with sweet ripened pear and goat cheese. How come the cheese has only two names instead of three? <laughs> like, you know, Tuscan goat cheese. Tuscan, yeah. <laughs> when I got the invitation, I figured it, that, that there's going to be something about trying to show that we're as mind, we're mindless eaters like everybody else, which <laughs> is perfectly fine with me. Then for the cuisine, juicy garlic roasted mm. chicken. There it is. With crisp green bean bundle oh. and potato canal. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So go ahead and begin. Just come up with a salad we don't know I'm not convinced. <laughs> My reputation as a food spy precedes me. Trump boy has a huge impact on what we taste. But it's not just our eyes. It's all of our senses that bias our taste. I'm going to ask you to try some chocolate cake here. The Cornell Food and Brand Lab is a series of rooms that we can observe what people eat, how they eat, when we make small changes like changing the lighting or changing the temperature in the room. By doing this, we better understand the psychology behind food behavior. How would you describe the taste? Better than I thought. Do you think it would have tasted as good if you'd given it to you on a paper plate like that? I may question it. This is a pretty nice display. We did a study a while back, and if you ask French people how they know they're through eating a meal, they say, I know I'm through eating a meal when I feel full or when the food no longer tastes good. We asked the same questions of 150 Chicagoans, and they said, I know I'm through eating a meal when everybody else is done or when my plate's empty. <laughs> Expectations determine what we think of food almost more than what the absolute taste does. Oh, thank you. That's yours. Yes. Vegetarian. Thank you. Fall off the plate. This all organic? Yeah, all organic. Love it. Delicious. Yeah, so our eyes not only influence what we think about food, but our eyes also influence how much food we eat, because we eat with our eyes, not with our stomach. So we set up the study to say, well, what would happen if your plate never empty? I mean, you just keep eating until you, you know, blew up? And so we developed this endless soup bowl, where when people would eat, the level in the soup bowl would slowly rise again. But after 20 minutes, when you ask them if they're full, they go, oh no, how could he be full? I mean, it's half full. You don't, you don't mind if I look under the Yeah, I don't. <laughs> don't lift up your plate, please. When you arm people with the results of one of your studies, but people have been eating, you know, every day for their whole lives, what is the likelihood that it's gonna actually change their behavior? But when we look at sort of the taste psychology of food, you know, learning that, Giving something a nice name makes people like it a lot more than they otherwise would. Well, and she is a host or hostess. That's a, that's a pretty darn easy thing to do. You can spend that last five minutes instead of trying to, you know, make the meal better. You can actually just make, <laughs> make the expectations better. Right. Make the little card better, right? Make that card better, yeah. <laughs> just look at today's play. You know, to be honest with you, pretty much is everything is store-bought. The roasted chicken is right. just like a normal rotisserie chicken. And as with the mashed potato, actually just out of a box. It took me like two minutes. <laughs> to In just a couple of minutes, you can make something really ordinary. It comes very special. It looks so beautiful. I mean, it was so special. I was oh, when I you. saw it. Means, so if I don't tell you this is store bought rotisserie chicken, <laughs> would you know? I would no. not have known. I would not. 
We've done probably about 250 experiments over the last 20 years, and one thing that amazes me is that nobody believes these little cues in our environment influence them. Oh, oh here comes the dessert. Oh. They don't believe they're influenced by whether they eat enough a nice plate or not. They don't believe they're influenced by the label in the wine bottle. And that's what makes these things so powerful. But that's also how you can use these to make people think you're a whole lot better cook <laughs> than you actually are. All right, I'll confess. I know the trick. Um, it's it's supposed to be simple stuff presented well, but I think it tastes good. I think it's wonderful. So maybe I'm just fooled by the presentation, but I think it genuinely tastes good. Mm -hmm. But I give the credit to Jennifer, though. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>